son, and then take a moment if you would and introduce the other family members that are here. Well, let me do it this way. <coughs> you know, before I came to Florida, in our church up here, we give out awards to the one that had the most relatives in the church, and I won it. I think about a, half of the people in our church were related to me one way or another. And this is only a small part, and I'm proud to have it with us. And uh, <coughs> before I introduce my son, I'd like to introduce our, part of our family. The first one is my mother, and uh, Gary and Sheila. Uh, yeah, yeah. Cheryl. And their family, and John and, and uh, Violet, and their daughter. And we're thankful for them to come and be with us. And uh, I like to. Say it, it's always been mine. In my heart, that, that my son would be ordained before I die. And it's because <coughs> it's because I know my son. And uh, even though we raised our children from the time they were just a few weeks old in church. Randy, and we believed that he was saved after just a short time in his life and after he never was, but he wasn't saved until he went away to college and after he found Jesus in time. And uh, my son had suffered because he gave his life to the Lord through all his years. He's given up so much because he loved Jesus and he wanted to serve him. And I'm proud. I thank the church for allowing this man. It's been my prayer for a long time of it. Because I know that Randy has so, given up so much to be ordained, or not to be ordained, but to serve God. And I'm just thankful that it's the time it's going to happen. Randy.
commonly when you pray to ask Jesus in your heart, we believe that you'd be converted. I don't think in that case I was because of the fact that I was never convicted of my sins or awakened in any way. All it did is it took the fear out of my heart that I didn't want to burn in hell. And so I continued in my life, and when I was in high school, I got this gnawing emptiness that grew and grew. I couldn't satisfy my life. I couldn't get this emptiness that just kept holding within me. The more I tried, the more it didn't work. I, I searched in a lot of areas. I did not search at Jesus because I already thought I had him. I was at church every week. And so while I sat and the pastor preached, sorry to say, I didn't hear a word he said. I thought about my car. How neat that would be when I get the new mag wheels on the back. Uh, and when I got my brand new engine put in that I never did and all this stuff. And that's all my God was. It was all my money into my car. It didn't seem to do much. It rusted away and it's gone now. I saw it in other ways. I chased the girls. My wife didn't want to hear this part of it. <laughs> but my emptiness, I looked at areas to fulfill that emptiness in my heart. And I kept going for areas and I thought a girlfriend must do that. And so as I went, they became my God also. And if I found a girlfriend, I'd fling myself at her feet. She was everything to me. I wanted to spend all my time with her, do everything I could with her, and I smothered every relationship I had. And so by the time I was uh, a freshman in college, and I didn't go away. This was when I was at home. I still lived at home. I was at Muskegon Community College. And the day came when I was hurting and I'm still hurting a girl who told me for the sixth time. I hear I was Mr. Popular in school and all this stuff, and it didn't work. No answers, no satisfaction. Everything continually was a dead end. God wouldn't allow it to happen. He wanted me. So everywhere I tried to go, he stopped me. I didn't realize it then, but looking back, I can see it. His sovereignty is good. So as I sat in pain and agony after this final girl that I thought for sure was my love for my life, broke up with me. I did something for the first time in my life. She was ragging on me because I didn't swear and I was such a moral person with my mouth but in my life and my pride and so forth I wasn't so moral. And I, and she cursed. And I was raised to know better than to do that even though I wasn't really a Christian. And when she cursed, I cursed for the first time in my life. I copied her and I said, I want you. And the first time in my life I had an experience with God that I never knew could have. But I heard the voice of God strike through my very being with the simple words, I'm not your God. And it stung me like an arrow. I felt the pain in my heart and my emotions were so tight and so angered and so hurting because this whole relationship and my whole life was unraveling that I kind of let it go. And yet it nagged in my heart. Never in my life it had ever happened to me before. I never heard the voice of God. I never knew God spoke this way, but it was there. A number of months went by. I was angry at God. I tried to bargain with God. I tried to trade with God to get my girlfriend back. I promised him the world if you just give her back to me, and I did promise this, and I tried to buy him off. I tried to do everything I could to get what I wanted, and it didn't work. He would not listen to me. And I went through a great period of time of anger. I'd go out in the woods and scream and yell at him. You ever done that? I was wild. I did it. I'd stand out there and yell at him at the top of my voice. I went out in the woods. At least I was smart enough that nobody would hear me except for him, I guess. But that kept my reputation good, too. I was a nice, clean-cut boy that way. But I'd yell, cry, tell him I was sorry for being such a fool, and then go through a cycle again. Finally, something snapped. And I realized, and it wasn't something suddenly, the conviction of God began to settle into me. And I realized my sin was so horrid that I had blasphemed God, that my pride was so arrogant that I'd do such a thing, that my morality was evil. And I sat before God, and I realized for the first time in my life that I deserved hell, that I was guilty. And there was no hope for that. And the only reason and just thing for God to do was for him to judge me and cast me away. And so as foolish as I was, I didn't go ask forgiveness. It didn't dawn on me. I assumed that such, since I was so wicked and evil, why bother? I deserve it, so I should just get my just reward. And so for a period of a couple weeks, I thought maybe I'd get run over by a truck. Something. 
that I pay the price. And I figured it was going to come, and I, I didn't struggle with it. I knew God was right for what he did. And so out of that mentality of expecting to be punished for my great sin before God, and waiting patiently for him to execute the judgment, because I knew I deserved it for the first time, the strangest thing in the world happened to me. God revealed his love to me. I went to a youth meeting, had nothing to do with the youth meeting, they were just singing a song, and they were ignoring me. But during the time that they were just standing there singing, the thing happened like in Romans chapter 5, verse 5, where it says, The love of God is shed abroad in your heart through the Holy Spirit. Perhaps you've heard of that scripture. I never remember ever reading it. And I don't know how I can tell you that I experienced it. But I know at that point, the most unusual thing happened to me. Because I literally felt, or I don't know, I hate the word felt, because you think of a charismatic Pentecostal, some wild thing. But I know that I know that I know that I was flooded through my whole being with the love of God. It was like a liquid love or something. I don't know how to describe it. But I sensed it, and it so was powerful in my, my heart that I was astonished that God would love me. I couldn't believe it. All my sin, and he loved me. That did one thing. It blew my mind. And that right there, I didn't give the regular prayer you're supposed to give when you go to church. I said, Lord, if you love me this much, you've got me forever. I couldn't believe it. And that was my absolute commitment in the beginning of a walk with God. I had heard about it. The pastors talked about it. My Sunday school teachers talked about it. My mother talked about it. I heard about it. And I met God. What a change. I blew away my friends. I dragged them all to the meeting next week. I thought the meeting still had something to do with it, so I dragged them all there. After about two weeks, they got bored, and I started telling them about Jesus instead of the meeting. I just began to do all kinds of crazy things. We had prayer meetings. Hey, we were 19. You're not supposed to have prayer meetings. You're supposed to go to church and listen to sermons, right? We had Bible studies. Everything trans turned around in my heart. I got hungry for God, and it wouldn't stop. I couldn't put the Bible down. I didn't understand, but for some reason, the Bible was a new book. I wanted it, and I wanted it, and I wanted it some more. And no more did my mom have to rag me, why don't you read your Bible? I probably thought, you're going to stop just reading the Bible and do something constructive around here? But instead, I read the Bible, I fell asleep on my Bible, I read more Bibles because I'd read them until I fell asleep, and I wake up and they're all ripped to shreds because I rolled on them when I fell asleep. Um, but the Bible was real. It became such a life. I couldn't understand a word it said. I read it three <coughs> twice, I think. And I still didn't understand what it said, but it felt so good inside. I don't know what to tell you, but it took me a long time to understand it, but boy, did it feel good. It's just like a little baby drinking milk. It tasted good. Other things began to change in my life. I immediately found that my friends needed Christ, and some came to him, and we began a small fellowship of friends that... We just we fellowshiped and fellowshiped and fellowshiped some more around, around Jesus. In fact, we got to the point where we didn't do anything except for with, with Jesus around him. If we wanted to get together, we didn't have a party. We had a Bible study. That was the fun. Our fun was yelling and screaming at each other, arguing about the Bible and whether we were wrong or right. We had a blast. It was good. It was fun. It became my life. Six months passed. This was in September of 1971. In the winter of 72, it dawned on me one day, I don't know why, that after six months, this joy was so flooding out of my heart, I couldn't hardly stand it. My life was so changed, I couldn't figure it out. And I thought, Lord, I've never stopped and really thanked you or even asked you if you want me to do anything. I've just enjoyed this new life, and it's so been so good and so great. I've had so much fun, and my life's so wonderful. But you want me to do something by chance? I don't know what you want, but maybe there's something I can do. Oh, I never guessed what God would say. I never understood. I don't come from a family of preachers. I never, I don't know if there's ever been one in our family or not. I never even dawned on me that God would call me to preach God's word. It was the farthest thing from my mind. I never dreamed of it. But as I began in my secret prayers, I said, Lord, I ask you today, is there something that you want me to do? Anything, I want to do it. You love me so much. Nothing happened. Next day, Lord, I never told my friends, I never told my cousin, I never told anybody what I was praying. 
about two weeks or one week past, it was in that very short period of time. And a very odd thing began to happen. For the week that I was praying that prayer, every single day, no matter where I turned, I, I'd witness to a kid. I was helping out with Youth for Christ, so I'd be talking to kids. And then, out of strangely, I remember a girl I was sitting on a bus. She was in the back seat, and I was in a seat in front of her. I turned around and talking to her, and I shared with her Jesus. She stopped and looked at me in the face and said, "Are you a preacher?" No, I'm not a preacher. What are you talking about? You know? And I was into that. Next day, I shared with somebody and said, Are you a preacher? I said, No, why? Next day, Are you a preacher? No, why? After a, every single day after day for almost, a, I think it was seven days straight, straight, somebody would stop out of the clear blue sky and look at me and say, Are you a preacher? Are you going to be a preacher? You ought to be a preacher. I thought, Lord, you try to tell me something? This is kind of weird. And see, I'm, I'm thick-headed, so it took me a while. But after this week of this going on, every day I kept thinking, does God talk this way to people? I mean, I still look pretty dumb, I guess. I didn't know. I, and I thought, man, that's wild. Huh, Lord, you couldn't want me to be a preacher. That's the craziest thing I've ever heard of. I so, thought, nah. Well, then I got to, to our Bible study with my friends again, and I, I shared with them, you know, I never told you this, guys, but the last couple of weeks I've been praying for the Lord want me to do something. And I, I think this is the crazy thing, but could God want me to be a preacher? And I thought they'd laugh. My one friend, wise friend Mike Luker, who used to be my youth director, became my friend. He looked me right in the face and said, no, I believe God already has called you to be a preacher. Why is that? He said, you asked. In January of that year, we had just received a new pastor that came to our church and said, you go ask him. The first Sunday he was here, I pointed you out and said, see that guy right there? He's going to be a preacher. So suddenly, everywhere I turned and everywhere I looked, this came before my face. And I went back to God and I said, Lord, this has got to be crazy. I, you can't be calling me to do this. I mean, I, I asked if you want me to do something, but would you want me to do that, honestly? And as I prayed and prayed about it, I said, okay, Lord, if you honestly want me to do this, I'll do it. But I don't know what to do. I don't even, I never thought about it. What do I do? And the moment I surrendered, not a person ever again said, you ought to be a preacher. They probably not wish I wasn't one. But at that point, it just stopped and the whole thing quit and a great peace came into my heart that I knew I was obeying the Spirit of God. And then from that time on, God began to prove his work and prove his hand that that was very much his call in my life. And he called me to be a preacher of the gospel. Randy's sister, Christy, a godly young lady, met a godly young man. Mark. And they married. They're now pastoring in Georgia. And just after Ted drops up, comes and sings, Mark is going to come and present a personal challenge to Randy and to each of us. <coughs> If he has to 
And I want to share just a brief message with you this evening on the mission and the mission that we all have as preachers of the gospel. And this mission was originally given to Moses at the burning bush. And I want you to notice that Moses, after perceiving God's mission, came up with three good excuses why he shouldn't be doing this. And I think that everybody who's uh, thinking about being in the ordained ministry has struggled with these three excuses. Not only have you struggled with them before you actually take that big step of ordination, but you struggle with these three excuses well into your ministry uh, almost every day. And I want us to look at those. Let's look at chapter 3, beginning with verse 10. Therefore, come now and I will send to you to, to Pharaoh, so that you may bring my people, the sons of Israel, out of Egypt. Then verse 11, the first excuse. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh, and that I should bring the sons of Israel out of Egypt? Who am I? In other words, why me? Why me? And if you're a minister of the gospel, you'll have struggled with this issue, and that is, I don't really want to do this. I can think of a lot of other things in my life that I would rather do. This is a calling that we're called to. It's not something that we choose to do. It's something that God compels us to do. He calls us to this ministry. It's an awesome ministry. Because we serve an awesome God. It's an awesome, incredible message that we have. And our first reaction is to stand back and say, I, I can't do this. This is too big for me. This is too big a job. And it's something that we're called to. And I think that we have to realize that when we get discouraged. Now, there are a lot of men who go into the ministry because they think they can make a fair living at it. They think, you know, it's a good income or can be and it's a good, easy job. But these men aren't called of God. Because you don't go into the ministry because you want to make a living. You go into the ministry because God has called you to proclaim this very special message that He has. It's not something that you decide. It's something that you're called to. And if you're called to this ministry, you've got to assume that God is going to equip you with the right kind of gifts. And primarily, the ministry is a speaking occupation. Most of the time you spend, uh, you spend speaking, preaching the Word. That's the most important thing I believe that we can do as preachers. There's a lot of other important things, but I think the most important thing that we can do is preach the Word. And God has given Randy, I believe, the gift to preach. I hear in L.C. this morning, I sense that L.C. had a gift of preaching, of speaking. And I hope that God has given me the same gift. So if God has called us, He's given us the gifts. So don't be intimidated. Be courageous. Go ahead. Preach the Word. Practice the gift that God has given you. Okay, that's the first one. Let's look at the second one, verse 13. And then Moses said to God, Behold, I am going to the sons of Israel, and I shall say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. Now they may say to me, What is his name? And what shall I say to them? In other words, what's... What's my message going to be? What am I going to share with these folks? And I want to tell you, every week I struggle with this whole issue. What am I going to share? I bared my whole soul last week. You know, what more can I say? <laughs> but it's a constant battle. <coughs> what am I going to say? What about this 
message that we preach. It's a positive message, isn't it? It's a positive message. It's a message that's full of love and compassion. It's the greatest message that has ever been told. It's a kind message. It's a life-changing message. It's a message of reconciliation, of bringing people together, one another, and with their God. When you preach this message, remember that it's a positive message. That's a message full of love. I don't know about y'all, but I get tired sometimes of hearing negative preaching, angry preaching. It shouldn't be that. It should be a, a gentle message, a message of love. That's not to say you never speak strongly against sin, but your demeanor shouldn't be angry. You should be positive and loving and kind because that's the kind of message that we preach. You know, our, our task as preachers is not to convince people that they're sinners. Did you know that? Did you know that Jesus Christ never said to one person in his whole entire life that you are a sinner. He never called a single person a sinner. Now, he said a lot about sin, but he never called people sinners. See, Jesus didn't have to call people sinners because when they got close to him and they got near him, they felt within themselves this, this sort of unclean feeling, this sort of ugly feeling, this feeling that somehow they'd fallen short of what they're created to be. You see? And so our jobs as preachers is not so much that we are to convince people that they're sinners. Our job as preachers is to lift up the glory of Jesus Christ, the positive nature of Jesus Christ. And we get caught up in all the petty stuff, the negative stuff, the ugly stuff. And we're not to worry about that. I try to make the habit of my preaching to lift up Jesus Christ. Paint a beautiful, wonderful picture of who He is. And in doing that, I think people, in fact, the scriptures say, you lift me up, all men shall be drawn unto me. And that's our task as preachers. We're to draw people close to Him. And let Him work in their lives to convince them of their own sin. We don't do that by <clears throat> saying that they should live this way or that way, or they should do this or not do that. See, that's the do's and the don'ts. That's for getting negative again. But we're to show them Jesus Christ. And he'll change them. Have you ever heard the story of the luck of Roaring Camp? It's one of my favorite stories. This old mining town was full of some of the meanest, toughest miners that had ever lived. There were more murderers and thefts in this town than anywhere you could imagine. And there was this one woman whose name was Cherokee Sal. Well, Cherokee Sal, she tried to take care of all these rough and tough men. Unfortunately, she died while she gave birth <coughs> to a little baby. And these rough, tough men, they took that little baby and they wrapped it up in some dirty rags and put it in a box, an old dirty box. And those old men, they looked at that box and they said, you know, that's just not quite right. So they sent one of the boys down to Sacramento to get a beautiful rosewood cradle. And they put that baby and all those dirty rags into that beautiful rosewood cradle. And the boys looked at that and said, no, that's not right either. So they sent one of the other fellows down the road and they got some silk blankets and some beautiful linens. And they wrapped that little baby up in those beautiful linens and placed that baby in that beautiful rosewood cradle. And they sat on the floor. And when they sat on the floor, they noticed how dirty the floor was. And so these ornery old guys, they got down on their hands and knees and they started scrubbing that floor. Pretty soon that floor was sparkling clean. But all that did was to show the, the walls and the ceiling. And, you know, there were no curtains. So 
they all started to scrub the walls and they put up pretty curtains. And it was a beautiful sight. Of course, uh, babies don't sleep much, much when men are carrying on and cussing and that sort of thing. So they had to quit their cussing and carrying on and fighting. And one day they took the little baby out to the front of the mine there. They put the baby down and they noticed how dirty it was out there, so they started planting flowers and stuff around the entrance of the mine where they worked. And they would come out of the mine and they'd bring that little baby shiny little stones, beautiful stones. They reached down and put it next to the baby. Of course, they realized when they did that how dirty their hands were up against the baby's fresh, clean skin. Pretty soon, the country store was out of soap and all that kind of stuff, detergent. But you see the point I'm trying to make? The baby changed everything. And that's the way it is with Jesus Christ. He changes everything about us. And our primary job as ministers of the gospel is introduce people to the baby. Don't worry about it. How their life necessarily pans out. He'll, he'll take care. And we, we get all caught up. We get impatient. We think people ought to be perfect once they're saved. And, you know, God takes time to change people. I know He took a lot of time to change me. I had a lot of bad habits. Bad habits take time to change. You see? And that's the way it is in the ministry. We need to be patient, allowing people time to, to be changed by the Holy Spirit. Okay, finally, let's look at chapter 4. First verse, for the third excuse. Then Moses answered and said, What if they will not believe me? Or listen to what I say? For they may say, The Lord has not appeared to you. In other words, what if you run into some stubborn folk? that don't want to hear your message, that don't like you, don't think you have it all together. I like that in the church, you know. Ministry is really a difficult thing. I had a pastor friend of mine who said, uh, he said, I love to preach. And, and one of the leaders of the church said, well, you ought to love to preach as much as you get paid to preach. He said, well, I don't get paid to preach. He said, I get paid to put up with people. <laughs> There's a lot of putting up with people in the ministry. And it can be discouraging. <coughs> if we have our vision of what people ought to be, and so often they don't live up to it. And we can see what they can be in Jesus Christ, and we want that so bad for their lives, and we experience it ourselves, and, and yet they just don't respond. They just continue to live in a lost state, and it's discouraging. It really is. God's at work. Randy, when you preach the Word, one of the things I think you'll have to do, I feel kind of funny speaking to Randy, because really he's my senior by about 10 years. So I was ordained last summer, so I've got ordination seniority on him by about one year. So take this for whatever it's worth. <laughs> one of the things that uh, you're going to have to do the ministry is to absorb people's anger. The church is one of the places where people can come and unload their anger. If you unload your anger at school, you get a failing grade. If you unload your anger at work, you might get fired. If you unload your anger at home, you might get kicked out. <laughs> but you come here and you unload your anger on LC, there's not a thing he can do. Now that's, that's funny and we laugh but I'll I tell you from personal experience it can be awful hard as a pastor and we do it we do it to our pastors we unload on all the anger and frustration in our lives but that's what it's all about Jesus Christ hung on a cross and what did he do he absorbed into himself the sin, the anger, the frustration of humanity. As a gospel minister, we carry about in ourselves the body of Christ. And we absorb into ourselves people's anger and their frustration and their shortcomings. That can make it an awful hard road. But we don't have a choice. This is what we're called to. And there is no greater satisfaction no deeper peace 
than knowing that we obeyed God and that we've been faithful to His calling. Granted, that is what we hope for you and your calling in your life. Be faithful to Him to receive that satisfaction knowing that you followed Him. God bless you.
couple of presentations that we'd like to make. David Sanders just informed me that the reason he was late, they were just in an accident. And we're grateful that you're able to get here. You come, David, and on behalf of the church, make a presentation. also asked 
church family that help us take the chairs down. Uh, at least the majority of them. You can sit in a few of them and we'll take care of them a little later. Our Father, we thank you for what our hearts have experienced tonight. We thank you for the ministry of the Word as Mark shared from his heart and from the heart of God to your people. We thank you for Randy and for Cheryl, the boys. We thank you for this occasion. We believe it was timely. We believe that it was according to your plan in your timetable. And we pray now that as we just fellowship for this little time, that that our fellowship will be not only with one another, but with you. And because we are in tune and in Christ, we then can have fellowship one with another. Thank you for this.